open your Bible to the book of Philippians. Philippians, we're in chapter 3 today. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1, when you got it, say so. And it says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ." Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as a rubbish that I may gain Christ and being found and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word that is true. Thank you for these beautiful reminders this day of your love, God, of your goodness to us, of your greatness in who you are, God. And we do live to worship you in. So I pray that we would continue in the spirit of worship with our minds and our hearts stayed on you today. May you be glorified in our hearing of your word, but not just in hearing it, but in responding to it in faith and doing what you call us to do. Father, remove distractions from our minds and our hearts, Lord God, here in this room, and for those those who are joining us online as well. May your spirit move freely, may you speak clearly, and may we be responding to you in faith, God. We praise you and we thank you for all of this, and we ask you all of this in Jesus' name good name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you have not left already, our kids are dismissed to their classes at this time. And so your teachers will meet you and you will be able to have a great time with the teachers over there. For the rest of us who wish we were children, hallelujah, we are here in the sanctuary, glory to God. And so we are continuing in our indivisible series, our indivisible series. And so we live in a world that is full of instability, do we not? We live in a world where things are, are not always stable, things are always changing. And if I were to ask you today, if I were to ask you today, and I were to say, have you ever been let down by someone, I'm pretty sure that all of us would say amen. Man, all of us would raise our hands. But if I were to ask you this other question, not just if you've been let down, because I think that we've all been let down. I mean, if you think about your life, someone didn't show up who said they were going to show up. Someone didn't do something who said they were going to do something. But many times those things were not life changing. Though they were disappointing, you know, they were frustrating, they may have hurt, but there are other things in our lives that have happened, disappointments that are life changing that alter our life, that change the trajectory of the way that we live. It could be the death of someone we love. It could be the loss of a job. It could be a a, a diagnosis of sickness and different things that have occurred in our lives that have let us down. And yet we find ourselves in a a place where, man, things just changed radically. The fact is this, is that people are going to let you down. This is true, right? No matter what, Uh, you know, people are going to let you down. Church people are going to let you down. Come on now. Yeah. People who love Jesus, who really love Jesus, who I'm not talking about the fakes. I'm talking about real people that love Jesus, that are following the Lord, that are seeking God, that are that don't have any desire to hurt you or let you down. Guess what? They're going to let you down. Those things are going to happen. You know, there's going to be situations in our lives where things are going to change. But here's the reason why this message today, I think, becomes so important is because in the midst of all of the instability, you and I can have stability when our confidence is in that which does not change. 
See, the beauty of this is that in the midst of all of the changes that will occur in our lives, if we have our focus, if our confidence is in the one who never changes, we're going to get through the unstable times. I I didn't say you're not going to feel the hit. I didn't say you're not going to feel the trauma. I didn't say you're not going to be shaken in some way, shape, or form. But what I am saying is that you are going to be able to move through this because what? Because of the fact that your stability is because your confidence It's not in things, not in men, not even in yourselves. Your confidence is in the one who does not change. I want you to think about this this morning. Our confidence in Christ is only fully expressed when he is the only possible source for our stability. I'll say that again. Our confidence in Christ is only fully expressed when he is the only possible source for our stability. See, the fact is this. It is easy to say my confidence is in Christ, especially when things are good. It is easy to say I trust the Lord when your job is going well. Amen. It is easy to say, I trust the Lord when your marriage seems to be going all right. It is easy to say that I trust the Lord when it seems like I'm healthy and everything is okay. It is easy to trust the Lord when all, you know, ministry is going good. It's easy to say, man, I trust God. My confidence is there. However, when the rug gets pulled out from under you and these other things begin to fall, you know, job situations occur, sickness occur, whatever it is, what happens is in those moments, that is when your real confidence is exposed. That is where, where your stability is. Exposed. Is Christ really your source of stability? See, I would love to sit here and tell you, you know, man, I would die for Jesus. And I, and I think that I would, like if I had the choice to die for Jesus or not, you know, if it was between me, you know, denouncing Christ or me, you know, den- or, you know, me, you know, dying, I think I can say this confidently. I think that I would say yes. However, There are people that have been in situations like that who have heard those words, you either denounce Christ or you die, and they chose to repent later. It's easy to say, I'll die for Jesus. But when you're in that position, when you're in that moment, that's when it's real. It's easy to say when you come to the altar in marriage and say, you know, for sicker, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. It's easy to say that. It's easy to say I do, but what happens when sickness comes? What happens when worse comes? What happens when difficulty comes? See, it's easy in the good times, right? It's easy and all. It's all, see, see, here's the thing, church. We have to make sure that our confidence is where? Is in Christ above all. That our confidence is in him. Because listen, there you can, you can be stable in all other things and a bunch of other, you know, people or situations or circumstances that are good around us. But when there is nothing else around you that can give you stability, that's where your faith in Christ is really tested. When there's nothing else around you, that sounds real bleak, huh? (laughs) When there's nothing else around you that's stable, where that's when your faith comes out. That's where your confidence is. Today, I want to talk about having one confidence, church. We need to have one confidence. We've been talking about unity and what Paul is communicating to the church in Philippi is of his confidence. His confidence that is not in his flesh, his confidence that is not in his ability, his confidence that is in Christ and in Christ alone. The confidence that he is not only supposed to have, but that the people of Philippi, the church of Philippi is supposed to have. And us, because we are believers and followers of Jesus, guess what? Our confidence should be in Christ as well. Our confidence should be firm in who Christ is. And when we come into those moments of testing and those moments of trial, you know what will happen when our confidence is there? We will get through it together with God and with our brothers and sisters. So the first thing I want to ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, our ability to rejoice in the Lord is proportionate to our confidence in him. Our ability to rejoice in the Lord is proportionate to our confidence in him. Notice what Paul says in verse one. He says, finally, my brethren, it's like, it's almost like he's closing. But, you know, if you look over, you'll recognize that he's got a whole nother chapter. So you could think Paul is like a typical preacher, right? He's saying, I'm closing and he keeps going for another 30 minutes. 
But that's not necessarily what Paul was doing. What Paul is saying is that in response to all of these things that I've said, all these things that you've heard, all these things that you've learned about what it means to be a follower, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. You'll hear that again in chapter four when we get there. But he starts off here. Rejoice in the Lord. Have joy in the Lord. Have confidence in the Lord. And what is he doing? He is giving us a contrast between having confidence in the Lord or having confidence in other things. Paul's going to give us a list of things we could have confidence in more so that he could have confidence in. And yet he is saying, do not be confident in the flesh be confident in me. Be con- not in me, but be confident in the Lord. Be confident in who God is. Rejoice in the Lord. And he goes on and he tells them, for me to write to you again, these things is not tedious, but it is safe for you. And so for them, you know, some people were, will, you know, argue and say, well, did Paul write a letter that we don't have? Or is Paul saying, I'm writing to you things that I've already said to you? Either way, what Paul is doing is he's repeating himself and he's addressing them with certain issues that are going on in the church. There are some divisions and, there, and the reason for some of those divisions are obviously some attitudes, but also not just attitudes, but there's also some false teachers. There's some negative stuff that is going on. And so Paul first points them and says, hey, you need to rejoice in the Lord. And the only way we're going to be able to rejoice in the Lord is when what? Is when our confidence is really and firmly in him. If our confidence is not rooted firmly in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, here's what happens. Our joy or happiness, those words are used interchangeable in the scriptures, our joy, our happiness, contentment is where you have this joy at. It's going to be what? It is going to wane and it's going to be unstable. It is going to be inconsistent instead of doing what? Being firm and growing. What should be happening to us? What should be happening to you and I is that our faith should be growing in the Lord. Our faith should be becoming more firm and more stable in who God is. Our faith in the midst of instability, what should be occurring is that we are growing firmer in who Christ is. We are growing firmer in what Christ has done for us. We are growing firmer in what God created us for. We are growing firmer in that we are not, be, we're not waning in our commitment. We're not waning in our confidence. Listen, if our focus is not on Christ, and we've talked about this, and messages, especially in this series, if our focus is not on Christ, then what happens? Our joy begins to wane, becomes inconsistent. Why does this matter? Let me tell you why this matters so much. It's because when our faith is fickle, our joy will be shifting and our light will be an inconsequential flicker in the ever decaying moral darkness of our world. I'll say that again. When our faith is fickle, our joy is shifting, and our light will be an inconsequential flicker in the ever-decaying moral darkness of our world. See, here's what I want you to realize, and I try to help you to understand this all the time. Our faith is not just about us, but it is about a world that needs the gospel, We are living in a world that has rebelled against God on so many levels. We are living in a world, in a nation that has turned its back upon God on so many levels. We have legislated immorality year after year. Listen, we are in the situation we are in solely and primarily because we reject God's standards. We reject God's word. We do not uphold righteousness in our land. We do not stand firm for what God's word says. Therefore, church, and you don't want to hear this, and I know that I don't want to hear this, but we are walking our way to judgment as we continue to rebel against God. And in this moment where darkness is prevailing, where darkness is pervading the land, we as the church are called to be a light, not a flicker, but a light that shines brightly in the midst of the darkness that is calling people, not just once in a while when you're on a holy high and you feel good about Jesus, no, but you are called in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the difficulty to be a lighthouse in the midst of this world. The beauty of a lighthouse is that the light does not stop shining. When the storms are coming, when whatever is happening, that light continues to flow. That light continues to flow. Why? So that way the ships that are moving around, they know where they're going. They know where to harbor. They know where to land at church. We have to be that light in the midst of this world. We have to be the church of Jesus Christ. Not some partisan group of people that are trying to point some people over here for their confidence or point them over there for their confidence. We need to point people to Christ because he is the only one that is worthy of our confidence. 
And we as a church must call upon the name of the Lord. We must call upon God in repentance, must call upon God in humility and say, God, we need you. We need you as a church. We need you as a nation and continue to raise the banner of Christ. Because listen, I don't know about you. I know this about me. I don't want to be a flicker that came and somebody saw hope and then, and then ended up in despair. I want to be a light that drew people to Christ. Church, that's what we're supposed to be. Not just a flicker, not just a moment, not just a tweet, not just a post. No, no, no. A light that is shining brightly for the glory and for the honor of Christ our Savior. See, this is why it's so important to rejoice in the Lord, not in yourself, not in your own ability, not in your own accomplishments. It is important for us to rejoice in God, our Savior, to rejoice in who he is. This is why Paul, in the midst of his imprisonment, in the midst of what he was facing, he was there saying, rejoice in the Lord. Let your strength be in him. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what the scripture says, does it? That's what the scriptures teach us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. What are we rejoicing in? Listen, church, I'm not telling you can't rejoice in people. I'm not telling you can't celebrate people. I'm not telling you anything. What I'm saying is our ultimate joy has to be where? In the Lord and what Christ has done for us. The second thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, we must be on guard against the enemies of our confidence. So we have to understand that we must rejoice. We must have confidence in who God is, but we also, also not just having confidence in who God is, but we also need to be sure that we recognize there are enemies to our confidence. There are enemies that come against us to steal our confidence from the Lord. And here's what I want you to realize why this is so important. If the enemy can persuade you to place your confidence in anything besides Jesus, you know what he's done? He has led you to the doorstep of idolatry. If the enemy can lead you to put your confidence, your ultimate confidence, in anything besides Jesus, he can't make you an idolater, but he can lead you to the door, doorstep. He can lead you to that place. Listen, you know, you know you can worship people, right? You know, some of us, you know, we think about confidence. And I'm not telling you you shouldn't have some type of confidence in people, right? Like, you should have some level of confidence. Like, I, you know, I'm, mar I'm a married man. I have confidence in my wife, I mean, but I have ultimate confidence not in her. I have ultimate confidence in Christ. I have confidence, you know, and, and you know, I, I have confidence that that is in people. I trust, you know, certain things about people, but you're not my ultimate confidence. Same thing for you. Now, some of us, our, our, our confidence, right, is in work. <laughs> our confidence is, is in our job, you know, and then, and then we come and find out they're laying people off. Come on now. Wait a second. Where's my confidence? Is my confidence in the Lord? Or is, or, is my, or is my confidence somewhere else? Same thing with people. We put our confidence, our ultimate confidence in other things. And so we have to be sure that our confidence is where it needs to be. But most importantly, what Paul is drawing us to is help us understand that there's, there's some enemies to our confidence in the Lord. There are some things that vie for our confidence, that want us to, that, that, that desire for us to be confident. So here's the first thing. There's three things that I see here that Paul gives us in verses 2 through verse 7. And the first thing he says here, look at verse two, it says, beware of dogs. <laughs> beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. The first enemy that I see that the apostle Paul describes is dogs, evil workers, the mutilation. Can I tell you who Paul is talking about here? He's talking about those seemingly religious people. How do you like them apples? Oh, you think you're holy? You're a dog. You think you're righteous, you're an evil worker. You think your external holiness is great because you've been circumcised, that's, that's what he's talking about here. You're the mutilation. Something that's supposed to be beautiful, you've marred, that's what Paul is saying. So the first thing that he says that's an enemy to our confidence in the Lord is the false teaching that was there that was leading people to believe that their good works, and Paul is going to talk about those in a moment, that those are the things that save them, that those are the things that make them, that those are the things that, that, that seem to make them believe who they are is, you know, that's what makes them right. But the fact of the matter is, that's not what makes them who they are. These people said they knew Christ, and yet they were saying Jesus plus something else. G there's no Jesus plus, y'all. 
It's Jesus Christ alone. He is Savior. He is Lord. He is the one where our confidence is supposed to be. Paul goes on, though. He doesn't just leave us there. In verse 3, he says, letting us know how we know who he was talking about. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. See, Paul said, look, they think that they're great because they, and, and the people that he's talking about here specifically are those Judaizers that have been following Paul when you read the book of Acts. Those ones that were saying, oh, you know, you can be saved through Christ, but you still got to be circumcised. You can be saved through Christ, but you still have to obey all the laws in order for you to be saved, to, to really, be, we want to make sure you're saved. So you got to make sure you do everything that the law says. And Paul is like, no, 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 that's not accurate. Because we are the circumcision. Why? Because you know what Christ did for all of us? Man, woman, child, everybody who put their faith in Christ, he circumcised our hearts. He cut away that flesh. He gave us a new heart. He gives us new desires. He enables us to do what? To worship him by his spirit. He enables us to do what? To rejoice in Christ Jesus, to find our strength in him. And because of all of that, guess what? We put no confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh. In verse 4, and Paul says this, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. And so what does Paul do? Paul is going to make a comparison right now. Yeah. He's going to say, oh, y'all y'all, teachers think you're holy, right? You, you guys think you have something to say. Let me, let me give you my resume. Let me break this down for you to let you know who should have confidence in the flesh in this conversation. Let me, let me help you to understand this. And so Paul says what? He says, circumcised on the eighth day. So on the eighth day, exactly according to the law, his parents brought him to the temple and he was, he was circumcised of the stock of Israel. And so he's an Israelite by birth of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the special 12 tribes, the last son of, of Jacob, a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, not just a Hebrew, he's a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee. I mean, this guy was at the top of his game. He had his doctorate degree in theology. He was concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law. Homeboy was blameless. This dude was a stud. Come on now. Paul was the guy you wanted your daughter to marry. Come on. Paul was the guy you wanted your son to be like. Paul was the dude, according to Judaism. He was the man. He says, I got reason to boast in the flesh. He said, but that third enemy there, he said, no, 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 that second enemy, my good works in the flesh, that's an enemy to my confidence in Christ. If I look at my pedigree, if I look at everything that I had, that's an enemy to, the, to, to my confidence in Christ. If I look at everything, I see, that's one of the things why the, why, why the whole prosperity garbage message is terrible. Because you start measuring your Christianity by how many, you know, you know how, how many zeros are in your bank account. You start, not, not one zero, but many zeros, like, you know, in front of another number. You start measuring your life by the kind of car you drive, by the zip code in which you live, by the house that you live in. All of a sudden, you start measuring God's favor based upon on all of these other things that have nothing to do with God's favor in that in the fullness of the word that's not what this thing is about it's not about gaining for yourself it's about gaining for the glory of Christ Paul had it he had everything that anybody could want religiously and yet he says that's not enough but that's not the last one the third one that we see Paul communicate here verse 7 he says but what things were gained to me these I have counted loss for Christ. So the first thing that we see that is an issue is the, or, or, or an enemy is the dogs, evil workers, the mutilation, the seemingly religious. The second thing we see is the good works of the flesh. And the third thing that we see here is anything we are unwilling to lose for the sake of Christ. Anything that we are unwilling to lose for the sake of Christ can be an enemy to our dependence upon him. Now, I want you to know when Paul talks about this word there that he has counted everything lost, this is a transactional legal term. He's talking about forfeiting. He's giving everything up for the sake of Christ. So I, I just want you to think about this because we're talking about social capital. He gave it up. 
He gave up his personal um, comfort. He gave up promotion. You got to remember, Paul was being groomed. I mean, he was under Gamaliel, one of the great teachers. Paul was in line to be another one of the great teachers in the in, in Israel, one of the great voices in Israel. I mean, this guy went to the right schools. He went to the right teaching. He was, he was around the right people. He was around the right group. And Paul said, I count all that I was lost to gain Christ. Here's my question. Are you willing to count it all loss to gain Christ? If you were in his position, would you count it all loss to gain Christ? Would you give all of that up in order to gain Christ? See, that's one of the issues with us in our Americanized Christianity is that most of our commitment to Jesus is simply this. Hey, say a prayer. Maybe, right, depending on the service, depending on where you're at, maybe you got to walk to the front to an altar and you come and you say a prayer. And that can be embarrassing. And so, there, you know, there's some embarrassment there that may occur. I have no issue with that. But here's the thing. Is that the end of your commitment to Christ? Because if you go and you have somebody who is, you know, in a Muslim country and they go and they give their life to Jesus, well, first of all, they're going to be disowned by their family. That's a problem. Hello. But not only that, now they got a mark on their back because now they're naming Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so wait a second, that is a different thing than simply saying a prayer one day. What does it cost you to follow Christ? Because, I mean, if it's not costing us anything, there's a problem, church. If it's not costing us something, there is an issue. And so Paul is calling us to a full-on confidence in Christ. So here's the thing we have to realize is that as followers of Jesus, we must fight daily, daily, not just once in a while, but we must fight daily to live a life that is completely and fully dependent upon God. A life that says my accomplishments, my abilities, my ambitions, the things that would give me a leg up, every one of those things is subject to the Lordship of Jesus. Church, that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to live in complete and total subjection all of our life to the Lordship of Christ. This is what Jesus calls us to live. He calls us to live in this manner. And so I'll ask you this question one time now, and I'll ask you again at the end, where is your confidence? This morning, sincerely, where is your confidence? Is your confidence in Christ? Is it in yourself? Is it in someone else? Or is it in something else? If you are being honest and you say that your confidence is somewhere else, and today God calls you to repent and put your confidence completely in him and in him alone. See, the beauty of the cross, we'll celebrate communion in a moment, but the beauty of the cross and the resurrection is that it gives us the ability to have confidence in Christ. Because Jesus didn't just come and suffer a sinner's death, but he rose again victoriously. And because of that resurrection, you and I can have full confidence in him. Because we know, man, come on now, you don't know anybody. I don't know anybody who rose from the dead. Come on now. I don't know anybody who died and said, hey, let me be back in three days and then came back. Come on now. We, we don't know anybody like that. Not physically, but we do know one who did that. And because he did that, he did something that no one else could do. And so we have a confidence in him. We have a right to be confident in him because we know that if he didn't fail that, he won't fail us. The third thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, when Christ is our confidence, nothing compares to knowing him. When Christ is our confidence, nothing compares to knowing him. I love this portion of scripture here, verses eight through 11. With the apostle Paul, he did what? He counted his losses. Think about this now. He counted his losses. He counted what he could have had. He counted what he had already attained. And he found that knowing Christ was worth losing everything and anything else. Think about his words that he says here. Look at me. Look with me at verse 8 and we'll walk through this together. He says, yet indeed, I also count all things, not some things. I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So what did he say? I count everything that I had. I count everything that I could ever have. I count it all as dung. That's what he says. I count it all as fecal matter. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to get this. 
This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, I counted it all garbage for the comparative thing of knowing Christ. It all matters nothing in comparison to knowing Christ. Is that your heart today? That everything that you could gain is nothing in comparison to knowing Christ. This is what Paul wants. This is what Paul is communicating to them. And this is what the Lord wants from us. That we would want to know him above everything else. That in comparison, it's not to say that you're not going to do things. That's not what I'm saying. Don't hear that. What I'm saying is that none of those things should be comparable to knowing who Christ is to knowing him for who he is in his fullness and the reality of his glory, his wonder, his splendor. Verse nine, he says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, that righteousness, which is from God by faith. I love this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul just said here a couple of verses earlier, according to the law, he was blameless. And yet he says, I don't want a righteousness of my own. I don't want to just be a good person. I don't want to just be morally upright. I want to be a person who the resurrection power of Jesus resides in me on such a level that people are seeing Christ work in me. I want the resurrection reality. I want to know him. I don't want to just know about him. I just want to know. I don't want to just know more facts about him. I don't want to just know what his names are. I don't want to just know more definitions of who God is. I want to know him intimately. I want to know him like, man, like, like, like I know my myself. I want to know him. This is what Paul is saying. I mean, I think he knew God. He encountered God, but he said, God, I want to know you above everything else. I'll lay everything else down, but God, I want to know you. Whatever it costs, I want to know you. Whatever I lose, I want to know you. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. See, we all want that, don't we? We want to know the power of God in our lives. We want to see God's positive attributes in our life. We want to see God's work in our life. However, he goes on to say, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. Not the fellowship of good times. See, we all want to know Jesus in these beautiful, man, and I thank God. Can we give God a hand for our, for our music ministry? Just, I mean, I mean, I thank God for our music ministry. They don't just sing songs, man. They lead worship. And I love that because we have a place where we can come together and we are going to be led to worship God. We're going to be led to focus in on Jesus. We're going to be led to press into God's presence. I love that. But can I tell you something? You know where the deepest fellowship where God comes? And you don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. It comes in suffering. You know why Christianity in America is so weak? Because there's so little suffering for Christ. Because there's so little hardship for Jesus. The greatest hardships that we have in Americanized Christianity is, let me give a big enough offering so I can get a big enough return so I can get the things that I want. Where are we laying our life down? Where are we suffering for the gospel? Where are we suffering for Christ's sake? See, the Jesus, when Paul is saying, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. But church, he doesn't end it there. He, he doesn't end it there. But I want to be conformed to your death. So not only... Is it fellowship and suffering? Is it revelation of who God is in our suffering? But it's also conforming to his death, where it's no longer about me, but it's all about Christ. It's no longer about me and my way of living. It's about Christ and him living in me, him living, moving, and breathing through me. It's about his life that I may attain to the resurrection, not because Paul was trying to reach something that God already reached for him, but because Paul wanted to do what? He wanted his life to exude the resurrection power of Jesus. 
Church, I hate to tell you this, and I, and I do because I know that this hurts. I know this doesn't excite you. But man, if we want to see the resurrection power of Jesus in our life, we have to see the death of our lives. We have to see the laying down of our lives. We have to see the relinquishing of our rights. We have to see the giving up of what is good for us just because we like it and saying, God, I want you above everything else. I want you above everything else. I want you over and above everything else. Christ, that's what I want. That's what Paul tells us. That's what Paul teaches us. I want you to just think for a moment, if you can imagine with me what our world would be like if the church was moved by one thing, and that was to know him. What would your family be like if everyone in your household was consumed with knowing God? What would your workplace be like if everybody in your atmosphere was consumed with one thing, knowing God? What would your community be like if everybody there was consumed with one thing, knowing God? Can I tell you something? It would look much different than it looks right now. Imagine this nation, if we were a people, the church, if we were a people who were serious about knowing God. Can I tell you what it would look like? It would look like the vision of this church, which is what? To please God in everything that we do. That's what we do. That, that, that's the vision of this church. We want to please God in everything that we do. You know what our desire is? That every one of you, it's not just for me to say this, it's that every one of you would have a desire in your heart that everything you do would be pleasing to the Lord. That every decision you make, that every action you take. But you know what? That's not going to become a reality until what? Until your greatest longing is to know him. Until your greatest longing is to experience him experience him in you, experience him through you. See, here's what I know is that righteousness granted should result in righteousness lived. Righteousness granted should result in righteousness lived. That we would be a people that have experienced the righteousness of God and that we are living for the glory of God. And church, I'll say this as I get ready to close. We cannot allow anything to, to satisfy our spiritual hunger and thirst for God, anything less than himself. Because if anything less satisfies that place that only God should have, it will result in a misplaced confidence. See, when I allow people, when I allow things, when I allow accomplishments, when I allow goals, when I allow other stuff to fill the void that only God should fill, you know what happens? I start becoming more confident in those things because those things made me feel joy. Those things brought me happiness. That accomplishment over there made me feel satisfaction. But wait a second. Is there a real level of deep satisfaction in who God is and what God is showing you? Because that needs to be the greatest satisfaction. Because here's the fact. At some point in your life, you're going to fail. At some point in your life, a goal that you have is not going to be met. If you haven't been disappointed yet, it's coming. Come on now. I know, I know that's super encouraging. <laughs> get ready for disappointment. Get ready for someone to let you know, you're like, oh man, Bishop, stop talking like that. Listen, it's, it's like the person who says, you know, you should never pray for patience, you know, because when you pray for patience, hardship comes. Can I tell you a little secret? It doesn't matter if you pray or not, hardship's coming because God wants you to be patient. Hello. What do you mean, Bishop? No, it's not about what you want. This isn't like you order from the menu. Okay, I want patience. No, I don't want patience. No, no, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to be like Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, you need to reflect him. Therefore, he picks what's on the menu, not you. Hello. <laughs> but when the disappointment comes, are you going to be shaken to the point that you don't know where you stand? Or are you just going to lose something? See, because what should happen is this, is I should feel the shaking, but I shouldn't be shaken. When our confidence is truly in the Lord, when disappointment comes, when hardship comes, we're touched. But we're not defeated, y'all. Our confidence is not shaken. Because our confidence is not in things. It's not in people. It's in a Savior who does not change. And so here's my closing question for you. Where's your confidence? Where's your confidence today? Is your confidence in Christ and Christ alone? Or is your confidence in other things? 
You know if God was speaking to you today, whether you're here, whether you're online right now, you know if God is speaking to you, say, man, your confidence is not in me like it should be. You know what he calls you to do? He calls you to turn from putting confidence in anything else than him. He calls you to repent today. That's the beauty of the gospel, is that God brings us to the confrontation of our sin, of our shortcomings. But you know what he does? He says, but I'm here. If you will confess your sin, I'm faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's a beautiful promise from God. But he doesn't want you to take it lightly. He wants you to understand the weight of the sin that you're holding on to. He wants you to understand the weight of the sin that is hindering you, where your confidence is in something other than him. And he says, son, daughter, turn from that confidence. Turn to me today. Trust me with your life. That's the beauty of the gospel. Let's bow our head and let's pray together. Father, in this moment, we humble our hearts as we prepare to partake in communion, God, we humble our hearts and we ask you to search us. Lord, you know where our confidence is. And Lord, maybe our confidence is in you in most areas, but not in all areas. And so we ask, give us the grace to repent today. Give us the grace to trust you today. Give us the grace to put our confidence in you today. Purify us. We humble our hearts and we ask you, God, be glorified in us. Father, let our confidence be in you to such a degree, God, that the light of your gospel, that the light of your kingdom shines brightly through us in the midst of this dark and decaying world. We pray these things believing, and we ask this all in Jesus' good name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Hey there, thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this service was a blessing to you. I pray that your faith was built. I pray that you were encouraged in this season of your life, wherever you are, whatever you're going through. I hope that God ministered to you. I hope that God called you to action. And I hope that you'll take the next steps, whatever that is in your life. Uh, one thing that I wanna say is that if this is your first time joining us online, please do me a favor and send me a message. You can send me a message to bishop at corefaithchurch.org. If you happen to be on Facebook, you can also just IM us there and we will respond to that message. But I'd love to just thank you for joining us and just hear from you. And if you have a prayer request, if we can pray for you in any way, uh, please let me know. You can also send again to bishop at corefaithchurch.org. We would love to pray for you and uh, just be there for you any way that we can. If there's any other way that we can serve you in this season, please do don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. Also, I want to say thank you to all of you who have been joining us online weekly and have been faithful in your support of the ministry. One of the greatest things that I see and I'm so encouraged by is the fact that you are giving toward the cause of the gospel. God has called us to do this work and you are there with us. And so thank you so much for giving. Um, if you haven't given yet and you would like to give, all you have to do is text Core Faith to 73256. Again, just text Core Faith to 73256, and that will lead you to where you can go ahead and you can give one time, or you can set up on, uh, ongoing giving. And so again, thank you so much for that. And if you have any questions, if you have a prayer request, or you want to contact us, please email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. I would love to hear from you. Hope to see you next week. God bless you.